Well, I mean, our country has an extremely long history uh, of race troubles, uh, of race hatred, of all kinds of uh, interreligious bigotries and hatred and so on, and it goes right back to the beginning. Uh, you know, obviously it has been said many times uh, that slavery was our original sin, and I think that's certainly true in many ways. But it's worth remembering, uh, you know, that we also were part of the genocide of Native Americans in this country. It's worth remembering that people like Ben Franklin uh, went on and on about uh, the miserable Germans. They're of a stupid sort, he said. These people, they're incapable of learning the English language. So right from the very beginning uh, of the colonial era, we see these kinds of hatreds, and it has gone on and on. In the 19th century, we saw major movements, like in the 1840s, the Know Nothing Movement, which attacked essentially uh, German and Irish Catholics. There were enormous numbers of Catholics, the Irish, because of the potato famine uh, coming to this country. And this is at a time when the United States was very much dominated by Protestant whites who saw Catholics uh, in a little the way you'll hear uh, Nazis describe Jews. They have other loyalties. They're secretly taking orders uh, from the Pope in Rome and so on. So it was this idea that there were subversive elements out there. And this continued right through the 19th century. Of course, the Civil War was absolutely 100% uh, fought to defend and maintain white supremacy. Uh, but after that, we saw similar kinds of reactions. Uh, there was another uh, anti-Catholic scare in the 1890s in the midst of the Big Depression. Uh, that was also the period uh, when the Jim Crow was essentially imposed. Uh, on black people in the South as well as elsewhere. In any case, you know, it goes on through the 20th century. I mean, in 1915, the so-called Second Era Klan uh, appears, very small at first, but by 1925, the Klan in America has something like four million members, by far the biggest Klan we've ever seen, and again, built almost entirely on opposition, not to black people and black voting and so on, but to Catholics and Jews who were immigrating once again in very large numbers. In the 1930s, we saw real fascist movements and proto-fascist movements in this country, many of which were greatly admired uh, by Adolf Hitler. Uh, you know, it's worth remembering that Hitler uh, once gave Henry Ford uh, the top award that could be given at the time to foreigners based on Henry Ford's uh, promulgating the so-called international Jew. Uh, a whole series of anti-Semitic writings uh, that were published between 1920 and 1927 by Henry Ford. Uh, you know, during the war, all this kind of petered out during World War II to some extent. After all, uh, more and more of the Second World War became a war against uh, kind of the ultimate outcome of anti-Semitism and racism and so on. But very quickly after the war ended, uh, we began to see once again uh, white supremacist uh, Klan-like groups appearing, and even neo-Nazi groups. Uh, probably the most important group of the period was the American Nazi Party, uh, which was formed uh, in 1959 and lasted until 1967, uh, when its founder, a naval commander by the name of George Lincoln Rockwell, was assassinated by one of his followers. You know, the American Nazi Party was really uh, quite important uh, historically because, you know, this was after the world had learned of the death camps, of the gas chambers, and so on. Uh, and yet here was George Lincoln Rockwell saying a number of things which became very important to neo-Nazis later on. Probably the most important thing was the claim that there was no Holocaust, that the Jews, quote-unquote, simply made this up uh, in order to extort money from the Germans uh, and others. Rockwell also pushed very early on uh, a theology known as Christian identity, an incredibly important, uh, if wildly heretical, reading of the Old Testament, uh, which claims uh, that actually Jews uh, are not really human at all. They are the product of a sexual union between Eve and the Garden of Eden and the serpent. So a Christian identity picks, pictures Jews not as the descendants of the Hebrews of the Bible, not as the chosen people of God, but as literally the children of Satan who are working uh, all the time to destroy uh, civilization and make the world safe for the return of their father, Satan.
So it's this incredibly virulent idea that was taking hold in large part thanks to George Lincoln Rockwell and some others. Uh, Christian identity really changed uh, in many ways the shape of the American radical right. Uh, Klan groups, for instance, which historically had always been essentially Protestant white groups, uh, but were not uh, by and large uh, uh, Nazi groups, uh, adopted Christian identity. At least half of the current Klan groups believe in Christian identity and therefore uh, began to see not black people as the ultimate enemy, but the Jews as the ultimate en enemy, standing behind black people, creating the civil rights movement, uh, you know, ruining our country and so on. Um, you know, so that was an important development because uh, essentially we've seen uh, the radical right in the United States Nazified. It has become more and more focused on the Jews as the primary enemy. Probably the next, the next huge thing that happened in terms of white supremacy in the United States uh, was the so-called Third Era Klan, which of course arose directly in opposition uh, to the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education desegregation decision having to do with public schools. Uh, you know, this was uh, the last really big powerful clan and also an incredibly violent clan. So, you know, uh, the clans of the 1950s and 1960s created such havoc, murdered so many people, and so publicly in many cases. The, the murder, for instance, of four uh, little girls in a Baptist church in Birmingham in 1963, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, in fact, the clan created so much violence uh, in the civil rights movement that many historians, I think, rightly credit, in a weird way, the Klan with ensuring uh, the passage of civil rights legislation. In other words, the nation, uh, which was rather reluctant to really adopt things like the Voting Rights Act and really uh, ensure that black people got the vote in this country, particularly in the Deep South, uh, you know, they, they uh, were essentially forced into the position of doing something based on what uh, the public in America was seeing on their television screens. Uh, people being beat nearly to death uh, on the Selma Bridge, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, you know, little girls being murdered in churches, people hung from trees and thrown over bridges. All of this was pushed very much into the face of the nation at a time when national television uh, was for the first time showing these kinds of things to a larger American uh, public. Uh, a lot of important things have happened uh, since the turn of the millennium, since around the year 2000. Uh, you know, what we saw in the first few years after that uh, was the kind of birth of a nativist anti-immigrant movement, the Minuteman groups and so on that appeared uh, in the hundreds uh, in the early 2000. So that was the beginning of a very strong anti-immigrant movement that was thick with racism. In other words, it wasn't certainly about Irish or German immigrants, it was about brown-skinned immigrants uh, from Mexico, from Central America, and so on. So more and more you saw this idea of the United States somehow being inundated by a flood of people who are not like us, who are not white, uh, who come from a country where they speak a different language, and so on. Um, you know, ultimately, uh, what happened was the movement just exploded after that rise from about 2000 to 2008 in 2008 and into 2009. Uh, what really happened to explain that? Well, Barack Obama was elected in November of 2008 as our first black president. And while I think most Americans remember that as you know, a really optimistic moment. We had overcome this terrible problem of race after hundreds of years of race problems in this country. There was a very, very sizable minority of white people, we're talking about tens of millions of people, uh, who felt uh, that their country was lost to them, that somehow Barack Obama and the White House represented uh, a country that no longer belonged to white people. In other words, uh, we white people have been dispossessed. We are now the oppressed minority. So in the wake of Obama's election, uh, there was an absolutely incredible growth in the radical right, especially among the so-called patriot groups, the militia groups. We saw the number of those groups rise from about 150 uh, in 2008 to nearly 1,400 groups in 2012, uh, four years later. 800% rise in, in four years. That's quite incredible and I, I think quite unprecedented, uh, certainly in contemporary history.
So it's out, in a sense, it's out of the Tea Party movement, uh, out of uh, white nationalist thinkers like Pat Buchanan, like Pat Robertson, that you get the beginnings, uh, or really the continuation, but the bringing to the surface again of the idea uh, that America is or should be fundamentally, as they say, European, meaning white. Uh, so meanwhile, these ideas are percolating very strongly in Europe, which has even a bigger uh, uh, kind of battle over Muslim immigration in particular than we do in the United States. So the identitarian movement is born in Europe uh, as a movement that is fundamentally anti-Muslim. The idea is European civilization is white people's civilization, Christian civilization, and it's being invaded by the Muslims. So it's presented like uh, the Battle of Tours in 732, right? Charles Martel, you know, through the Muslims, uh, the so-called Mohammedans back then, uh, out of Europe. Or like 1492, when the Spanish king and queen, Ferdinand and Isabella, expelled uh, the Moors, uh, the Muslims, as well as the Jews, uh, from the Iberian Peninsula. So it's this idea that Europe has to once again uh, fight back uh, against the Muslim invasion that is swamping us and destroying Western civilization, uh, and so on. Well, you know, that idea, that identitarian idea that begins in France and then spreads through Europe very quickly leaps across the ocean. Uh, and that very same year, uh, a racist thinker by the name of Paul Gottfried coins the phrase alternative right. Uh, he writes an essay about it, uh, and it is rather quickly picked up uh, by a number of people around the country. Uh, you know, one of the most significant, of course, is Stephen Bannon, who winds up being a chief strategic advisor to our president, Donald Trump. Uh, Bannon uh, was the, uh, used to run the, the right-wing website, Breitbart News, uh, and as he said uh, not so long ago, uh, when asked about it, uh, he made Breitbart into the platform for the alternative right. So again, you know, the alternative right was a kind of tricky rebranding uh, of what are essentially Klan-like positions, and in some cases Nazi-like positions, uh, but with a kind of jazzy uh, young people's edge. You know, it's sort of uh, white supremacy for the internet, uh, for the age of memes and tropes uh, and trolling of people and so on.